In the summer of 2002, I had my very first paying job. I was only 20 years old and on summer break for college. For my freshman and sophomore year, I had worked at the campus radio station as part of my financial aids work-study program. Somehow, I landed a summer gig at a small station in my hometown. It's a smallish town, home of 2,000 happy people and a few soreheads, as the town's welcome sign reads. Nevertheless, it is a rather rural area, and this was the only station for 30 miles. The radio station may have been small, but it blanketed most of the county with a population of over 20,000. I'm unsure of how many listeners the station actually had. I was young and naive and didn't give much attention to numbers, but I do remember listening to this station when I was very young and that it had been through a couple of revamps in my lifetime not just changing the studio's location from one side of Main Street to the other, further downtown, but also changing the call letters as well as the genre of music. When I was little, they played oldies, which I loved and everyone could listen to. But the summer I worked, it was more of a classic rock station with a few modern alternative songs mixed in. To be honest, both genres were just my cup of tea, and even at the age of 20, I held an impressive knowledge of interesting and relative trivia off the top of my head. I still do, but I was basically just a summer fill-in until school started up again. The job started off fairly nice, actually. The studio's new location was in the same building as the county paper. My show started at 5 in the morning and ended at 9 a.m., followed by two hours of production, one for lunch, and then continuing to monitor the studio's live satellite feed until the next guy came in at 2 p.m. He left the studio around 11 p.m., meaning the building was vacant from his departure until my arrival in the morning. I had to be at the studio no later than 4.30 a.m., this meant that I was the only person in the parking lot or the building until 8 a.m. when the administrative staff arrived. I had a key to the building, but it was only for the front door. There was a back door, but that required a different key. I wish I had that key. Every morning, I would unlock the front door, which faced Main Street, the busiest street in town, but obviously dead at 4.30 in the morning, and I would lock the dead bolt behind me as soon as I was inside. I didn't even turn on lights. I just went straight to my studio. I didn't have a password to the internet at the time, so I did most of my show prep at home. At the time, I had no reason to feel uncomfortable or scared. Yes, I was a 20-year-old woman alone in a building in the dark, but the building was right across the street from the police station, so I felt very safe. Besides, being a horror junkie, very little freaked me out anyway. Nevertheless, I never used my real name on the air, and nearly everyone in the office addressed me by my on-air name. The first couple weeks on the job were awesome. Summer break for my college had let out before the local elementary and high schools had, so mornings were often spent with contests and chatting on air with kids about how excited they were for the upcoming break from school. Once school let out for the summer, listenership declined a bit. Kids and their parents no longer listened to their radios while making the morning commute or riding the bus to school. That was okay. News and entertainment were what I was there for anyway. Even had a week-long spiel about my mother's ongoing battle with the possum who used the litter box on our back porch. The next week, listeners called in with their own ridiculous and bizarre tales, a segment I simply called Story Time. Some of the stories were cute, some hilarious, some I didn't bother airing because they were incoherent, lame, or unintelligible. It was Friday morning when he called. Warren. I remember his name clear as day. Warren McHale. 
It would be a name to haunt me for the rest of the summer. The call started as most did. Warren complimented my show and told me he listened every morning. I said thanks and gave my usual appreciation for having him as a listener. I can't even remember what his story was about, but I think it had something to do with one of his kids. It wasn't particularly entertaining, but I think I had been a bit sparse on stories that morning, so I aired it anyway. Following that weekend, I came in on Monday and my show went on as usual. Tuesday, Warren called to say he'd missed hearing me on the air over the weekend, which I found a little bit odd, but whatever. I guess he must have thought it sounded weird, so he requested a song as a cover. I obliged, of course. It was part of my job. Wednesday, he called again. This time, it was shortly after the start of my show, around 5.15 a.m. He requested another song. I thought it was bizarre that this guy would call me so early, especially since I'd only just started, but whatever. I didn't know anything about this guy. He could have been a farmer, and those could have been his normal hours. Maybe hearing his request got him through the morning farm work or something. But then, not even ten minutes after I played his song, he called again with another request. Now, I was used to this sort of behavior. I mean, I was guilty of it as a child. When the DJ played my song, I would get so excited to hear it on the air that I would immediately request another one. However, it's somewhat of an unspoken rule among jockeys that you don't let the same person make more than one request a show, let alone within the same hour. So I gave him my canned, I'll see what I can do response. I actually did end up playing his requested song about two hours later, simply by coincidence, and I didn't realize I'd done it until he called about five minutes later to thank me and request yet another song. I didn't play it. Thursday morning, he called again at the start of my on-air shift, requesting the same song he'd last requested the day before. By this point, I was starting to get a little annoyed by him, so I made up some excuse about already having a request for a song by that same artist coming up that hour. I'm not sure why, but he didn't call back the rest of the morning after that. In order to avoid suspicion, I did play a song by that artist and made up the name of the person requesting it, just in case he was still listening. Warren didn't call at all during my show that Friday. I was relieved, actually, and had a great show. When it was over, I did my usual routine of listening to the weather radio to get the day's forecast for the midday news. At about 9.20 a.m., one of the girls in the newspaper office knocked on the studio door and told me I had a phone call. I thought that was odd someone would call the newspaper office looking for me. Family, friends, and my boss all had my cell phone number or knew to call the studio line until my shift ended at 2 p.m. I asked who was calling. She said it was a man named Warren. Alarms went off in my head. Tell him I'm busy and he can call the studio line on Monday. The weekend was blissful, Warren-free couple of days. Monday, no call from Warren. It was a good day. Tuesday, he was back. This time, he started asking me more personal questions, like about my own taste in music, if I was from the area, if I had a boyfriend, what I looked like. I told him I had a caller on the other line. He quickly requested a song and hung up. Wednesday was when things started to get weird. He called around 6.30 a.m., one of my busiest times of the morning, and asked me if it would be possible to bring his son in for a tour of the station because he and his wife were going through a divorce and he just wanted something to do with his son. I told him that it would be something he'd have to set up with my boss, but that my boss was unfortunately on vacation that week and could not oblige him. Fair enough. 
He requested a song and hung up. When I got home, I sent my boss an email pleading to not let this guy take a tour of the place until after I had left for the day because he'd started to make me really uncomfortable. Thursday's show was great. No Warren. I thought maybe he wouldn't bother calling again until he could talk with my boss regarding a tour. However, when I left the studio and opened my car, I found a pale blue post-it note on my driver's seat. Not tucked under the windshield wiper, but actually lying in my seat. It was summer. I kept my windows cracked because of the heat, but I always, always locked my doors, so I figured someone must have just slipped a note through the crack. Maybe a co-worker or maybe someone accidentally bumped my car or something, and it was a sorry note with some insurance information or something. It wasn't. The note was in messy handwriting. It said, I love your show. Call me sometime. Warren. And then his number. I felt so sick at that moment. The parking lot had been filled with cars of employees and clients since 8 a.m. People usually started filtering in for the surrounding businesses about an hour before that. So how could he have known which one was mine? Unless he had physically been watching the building for me. Two possible scenarios popped into my head then. Either he had seen me leave and get into the car, which seemed unlikely considering he didn't know what I looked like or when my shift ended, or he had watched the lot in the early hours of the morning. He knew my car was the only one in the lot when my show began at 5 a.m. I closed my car door, locked it, and walked quickly back into the building with the post-it note in my hand. I found the office manager for the newspaper and told her everything. She informed the police across the street. They agreed to have an officer watch the building in the mornings when I arrived. We had his name and number, but I guess it wasn't enough to actually file charges. The next morning, my dad woke up at 4 a.m. just to drive me to work in his huge Ford F-150, dropped me off at the front door on Main Street. A cop sat in his car across the street. Both he and my dad waited until I was inside, locked the door, and gave them an all-clear wave before leaving. Warren didn't call that day but he did send me an email. I have no idea how he got my personal email address, but he did. He said he was interested in pursuing a career in radio and wanted to know what he needed to do to break into the business, how we should meet outside of work to discuss it, asked me of some places I'd like to go and if I'd like to see a movie since his wife had the kids for the weekend. He had even included a picture of himself. I did not respond. Immediately, I showed the email to my parents, and my mother printed it out. She worked as a nurse in the county ER for decades and knew several officers. She told one of them what was going on and showed him the email. Monday, we followed the same routine as we had Friday morning. My boss's flight was delayed, so he wouldn't be back until Tuesday. None of us seemed to mind. That is, until about 9.30 a.m. when Warren showed up at the office with his son. I never saw him. The studio didn't have any windows and the door was solid wood. There was a knock at the door, followed by the voice of Patricia, one of the administrative staff. Spiff Coley, it's Trish. Can I come in a sec? Still in the process of writing midday news, I didn't think anything of it, as I let her in. I liked Trish. I often spent my lunch break with her at her desk, so out of all of the rest of the employees, I'd have to say she was the one I was closest to, other than my boss. I unlocked the door and she rushed in, closing the door behind her and leaning against it. She spoke in a hushed and hurried tone. That guy is here, she said. My eyes went wide and I felt sick. Warren? Yeah, he brought his kid. What? 
You said you told him he could have a tour of the place. No, I didn't. I said he had to call Alan to arrange it. I know, but he wants to talk to you. Oh my god. I was going to vomit. So that's why I'm here to make it look like I'm asking you, but I'm going to go back out there and say that you're busy and you must talk to Alan, okay? Thanks, Trish. This is messed up. She added and started to leave. Lock the door behind me. She whispered and closed the door. She came back five minutes later to tell me he was gone. Said she'd walk me out to my dad's truck when my shift ended, just in case. That day, Dad took the scenic route home, just in case we were followed. We weren't. Wednesday morning, Warren called. He let me know just how disappointed he had been and how disappointed his son was to have come all that way to not have a tour after all. Again, I told him to call my boss to set up a tour. Why can't you give me one now? I couldn't breathe. It wasn't even seven in the morning yet. Was he actually there? Right then? Right outside? I didn't know what to do then. I couldn't think. I didn't say anything. I just hung up the phone. Immediately, I put on a Queen's Greatest Hit CD to buy myself some time so my listeners wouldn't think anything was out of the ordinary. When I picked the phone back up to call the police, Warren must have called back at the exact same time because I didn't hear a dial tone. I freaked out then, tears in my eyes. I thought he'd cut the phone lines. I was wrong. Spiff Coley? I heard him say, I don't know if he said anything after that. I just dropped the phone back on the receiver and got out my cell phone, called the police station across the street. Barely even a minute later, I heard a banging from outside the studio. Someone was banging on the glass of the front door. I dared to unlock the studio and peek through the crack in the door to peer through the darkness to the front door, fully expecting to see a large man with a gun waiting for me. Instead. I saw the reassuring silhouette of a police officer with his hands bridging his eyes against the glass so he could look in. I ran out of the studio and across the front room to unlock the door and throw my arms around this officer. Ask anyone who knows me, they'll tell you that I give out some of the best hugs. Because yes, I am definitely a hugger, but I don't think I'd ever hugged anyone so tightly in all my life. I told him what happened. He told me to go into the studio and lock the door while he and his partner outside canvassed the building. I did as he said, put in a couple of mixed billboard CDs to alternate between tracks with a couple of call letters peppered in and just sat there. Best I could, I gave the top of the hour weather report after about three minutes, trying not to sound as shaken as I felt. I didn't answer the phone when it rang. David Bowie was playing when the officer returned to tell me that the building was clear and his partner didn't see anyone suspicious outside. Still, he offered to stay with me until the office staff arrived. Naturally, I took him up on that offer. Even made him and his partner coffee. I called Trish to let her know what was going on, since she was usually the first one in. She arrived a little early and brought sausage and egg biscuits for the cops as a thank you for staying with me. Warren wasn't charged or arrested. We couldn't prove he had physically been there, and obtaining a phone record quickly just wasn't something a small town could do on short notice. Warren didn't call for the rest of the week. In fact, to my knowledge, he never called again. There's a reason for that. The first week of August, I took some time off work to get my wisdom teeth removed. Due to being unable to speak clearly following the surgery, I couldn't be on the air and just stayed home. One afternoon, my mother came into my room and said she needed to speak to me. Mom said her officer friend had told her about something that had happened only a couple hours before. Warren had been involved in a standoff with the police. I'm fuzzy on the exact details. She said he had been in his pickup truck and pulled over on the side of the road. She said that Warren had called his wife, making the demands that she sleep with him or he would kill himself. Even though their divorce was not finalized, his wife already had a new boyfriend with the intent of moving in with him and marrying him. 
This must have broken Warren. He had parked on the side of the road, shotgun in the passenger seat. Police cars were on the other side of the road, attempting to talk him out, negotiate. They even called his wife to talk with him, but of course, she refused to sleep with him. So he put the gun in his mouth and pulled the trigger. Because it was such a public ordeal, the story was published in the paper the next day. I still start shaking when I think about what could have happened if I had ever actually agreed to meet him. Creepy Mina here of the Worst Nightmare Channel. I hope you enjoyed that story of uh, one lady's experience with a stalker while she was a radio DJ. Have you ever had any kind of similar situation if you were in a public situation? If so, please tell us about it below. I'll try to keep this brief today. Give me a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already. Share on your favorite social networking platform. Follow me on Twitter as WorstNightmare6. And always remember to stay safe.